It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Hong Kong is one of my uh, favorite cities. It's always a, uh, a very interesting city to visit for many of the reasons that you'll see in the talk. And so, um, as, as Kitty already said, um, cities are kind of one of the features of, of the world today. They're one of the, sorry, I'm just hearing some feedback there. Is that, okay, we're good. Try again. So, um, Okay, so um, so Hong Kong is a very special setting when you think about what's happening to the world today. What you see is that uh, almost every nation on earth is becoming more and more urban. And one of the questions has been, can we understand what's going on and why? And to what extent can we see communalities between the ways people live throughout the world in these environments? And obviously, where they may be going. So until recently, all this was bound to sort of the experience that we all have as citizens of a place in, in, in each city. But my talk today will be a lot about um, sort of, I think, a, a change in perspective that's allowing us to understand um, that the condition of living in cities um, actually is quite general has general properties. And so if I uh, uh, succeed tonight, when you walk back on the streets of Hong Kong, you'll see in a different way. You'll understand in some ways why it is the way it is, and uh, even maybe how it may be transformed into the future. So uh, as Kitty said, I had to plug this in. This is the view from the balcony at the, at, at the new center. So go visit. This is at sunset. It's very pretty. And so uh, we've been having a meeting with a number of colleagues, mostly from Hong Kong, but also mainland China, about Chinese urbanization, particularly its sustainability, or lack thereof. Um, and so that's been the theme that brought us this time. Um, but um, as you will see, uh, part of what we're trying to do at the University of Chicago is using the experience of different parts of the world, Hong Kong in particular, to really bring to life a lot of what you can uh, see uh, in the city as uh, a way to understand cities more generally. So. Oh, no. OK. Can we take the video off, the sound? We tried to do this before. This would be quite informal, I'm afraid, but uh, there we go. So, so, OK. So I didn't want to have sound because it's distracting. This is just a, I love time lapse videos. And this is just a little time lapse of Hong Kong. You know where you are. You know the city well. But uh, this is one of the devices I use when I teach about cities that just tries to bring together sort of in one capsule in time a lot of the experience of being in a city, but kind of intensified by speed, right? So a lot of what happens in, in, in a city is, has to do with what you see here in this little clip. Space is very condensed. Time is very condensed. There are many things that can happen. And it's this transformation of the way we live from a life of subsistence to a life of interdependence that really uh, is characterized by cities. Now, Hong Kong is very special because it has some of the world records on some of the ways we've ever created cities. You'll see some throughout the talk, but the most spectacular one has been density. Hong Kong has been the densest place on Earth um, for, you know, for the last few decades. It's a little less dense than it used to be, as you probably know. But at some point, parts of Hong Kong had a population density of about a million people per square kilometer. So that's a population density that will never be repeated, probably, given what we see, even though many cities will continue to grow. But that gives you a, it's a way of telling the story of what urbanization is like. How is it that it's possible to people to live at these densities? Why would they ever do so? And of course, Hong Kong has its own story to tell about that. But also, um, you know, people started living at very low densities on the land, about a person per kilometer. So that factor of about a million is the kind of transformation that you see also in the kind of um, increases in resource consumption and wealth and so forth that is happening to our societies. So this compression of space and time that's so visible and that you can feel so intensely in Hong Kong is really a part of what's happening worldwide. So what's happening, I already introduced a little bit this theme, is that uh, until recently, we could forget that cities of America or cities in China or Hong Kong or cities in Europe had a lot of things in common. And if you read a lot of what people were writing about cities and urban life, there was a lot of emphasis on local experience, local culture, local food, language. All that is different. But, um, What's happening now is that we see processes that we've seen happen to some extent before in American and European cities in other parts of Asia happen again in new places like China or India or parts of Africa. 
They're happening much faster, often with much larger populations. But there are ways in which we can study them, particularly because of this phenomenon of universal urbanization. We can compare cities throughout the world. But we also are getting a lot of data, right? So we can see uh, a lot of the traces that people live in their lives. We all have a cell phone, right? So we're being measured all the time. The space here at WeWork, by the way, is very instrumented. We work with them a little bit because they design their spaces to be productive in some ways. But there's a lot of our lives that actually has become um, somewhat measurable in ways that are both good and creepy. But at the same time, are allowing us to uh, understand uh, a logic by which we come together socially and we use space. And so this convergence of factors is leading to something that people are starting to call urban science. I'll tell you a little bit about that. So basically a way of generally understanding life in cities and the forms of cities, but also practical aspects of that. Uh, a lot of cities are increasingly using um, what has been called urban analytics to just run the buses on time. You know, you see a lot of this a little bit in, uh, in, in the way c uh, cities run their systems, in the way, uh, um, for example, trash gets picked up or transit works, or even you interact with your government. So a lot of this is becoming essentially something that is being pushed by practical issues, but is leading to a whole body of knowledge and evidence that allows us to understand how we live and why. So by science, what I'll mean, you know, at University of Chicago, we're a scientific institution, we're mostly an institution for research and education. So for us to be sort of in this game, which is what my institute does, what is interesting is that somehow there's something that we can say that is general. So when I look at Hong Kong and I look perhaps, I have a sample a little bit of your life or my life in Chicago, I have a sense of what is parallel and what I can learn from your lives to mine and vice versa and then can take to yet a different city. So that may sound to you that that's not possible. Some people take that view. Some other people think it's quite similar. But I'll take you through some examples tonight as to how that works out and what are the things that are similar and the things that are different. Um, so I want to start sort of the biggest possible picture just to frame it. So this way um, you'll see a bit the change of perspective that we've had in the last few years. This is a photo, I, so this photo is very famous. You, you know what it is, right? It's Earthrise. This photo just had its 50th birthday. It was taken uh, in December 24th, 1968, so now a few months past that. It's the first photo that was taken from the Earth from moon orbit by a human. So that's its significance. And even though this is, of course, a product of the Apollo program going to the moon, its greatest importance is that it shifted the way people thought of the Earth. And they started thinking about the Earth as one. And the environmental movement often uses this image as a way to think about how we become sort of managers or stewards of the Earth and its environment. But at the same time, if you take this as a strong change in perspective, I still think, and you see that in our politics in, in the world today, particularly international politics, climate change, that this is a very complicated picture. It's very paralyzing to think we have a problem as big as the Earth. And also doesn't allow us to understand why the Earth is changing, why human life is changing, and what may be the causes and consequences, for example, of our resource use. If you advance this about 20 or 30 years, um, you start to get photos like this. So there's sort of a whole sequence here of how we used to take our telescopes and instruments to look at the sky. Uh, and increasingly in the last few years, we're pointing those instruments back at Earth and looking at ourselves in some sense. It's an Earth selfie. It's India, of course. But what you see here is that whatever is happening with humans, it's very concentrated in space. Um, it's also concentrated in time in ways that you'll see. But um, you'll see that all these bright spots of light, of course, are cities. You also see some highways and places that are, uh, are associated with movement there. But these points are not only where population is, but where resource consumption occurs. And if I could even show you, for example, wealth like GDP or um, measures of innovation, those, as I'll convince you later, are even more concentrated than population because they benefit from the density of people and get multiplied by it. So this is a somewhat different picture now, right? Where we're not looking at a whole planet, but we start looking at these places where um, people are and where you know, the dynamics of change that people are creating are increasingly um, concentrated. So then we're zooming in, right? So this is a photo of China. It's Xi'an. Uh, China's been building cities very fast. Many of the cities in China, of course, have been, one way or another, um, inspired by Hong Kong. So I'm, I'm not blaming you for this, but uh, this is quite different from Hong Kong. But uh, as you build cities, people often associate the issues of cities and the reasons to study cities 
with problems, right? So here are two problems at least, maybe more than two, but traffic, congestion, and air pollution. But this is one of the main issues, uh, and um, in many ways, planners, people that uh, practically try to design cities, this is often their main concern, air pollution and health and traffic. Uh, this is Hong Kong, you know this, so, uh, but it gives me a, a somewhat different picture, right? What I like about this picture is that to me it gives me a sense of speed, a little bit like that time lapse uh, video. It also gives me a sense of information, that these spaces are full of information, right? They're full of things that people are doing, uh, signals that people you know, may or may not pay attention to. Of course, a lot of it is just commercial and publicity, but a lot of it is other things too, and, and there's speed. So there's a lot of movement and interaction that these environments are creating and mediating. And there's no place like Hong Kong to see this, and I'll have probably one too many pictures about this sort of thing about Hong Kong. And then, of course, as you zoom in all the way to the person, you start seeing things like this. This is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And a lot of the urbanization that we may glorify around the world is actually quite poor and is happening in places where people are building these cities by themselves, by hand almost, and uh, where people are still poor, but nevertheless are starting to get infrastructure. So you see a little bit the electricity and uh, other cables coming in. People are starting to build with brick. And so these are often people that used to have a rural life and are coming to a city and starting to experience a different reality. But one of the things that's happening is exactly this, this, uh, this shift in perspective that I've just taken you through visually is happening throughout the world. We're asked to plan cities and understand cities and their sustainable future from the perspective of people's lives. And this we've not been able to do before. We just plan cities in terms of the built environment, how infrastructure and services tend to work. But increasingly, uh, we're being asked to take the perspective of how people experience the environment. So that's kind of exciting because it's an age-old problem as to you know, how people live and how they may live in the future. So I think that actually uh, every time I give, uh, so there's this format for this talk that I've given a couple of times. I gave it at once in New York City. Another, the last time I given it was in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I tried to have a quote by a local person. So this is a quote by a famous person in Hong Kong. I have to tell you, it was a little hotter than uh, uh, apparently you know, Americans and New Yorkers and San Franciscans uh, write enough that I could find lots of quotes. But for, uh, for Hong Kong, it seems like people are more circumspect and I couldn't find so many quotes. Do you know who that is? So this is speaking a little bit to this issue that when you look at cities actually, you can look at them through a lot of the struggles that people deal with, right? And people in Hong Kong just tell me how expensive it is, how intense it is, but also how exciting it is, right? So, um, so people have to grow by skillful frustrations in some sense. That's the condition of the city, but that's also a transformational step that allows people to invent and create new things in their lives and beyond. So who, did, who said that? It was a test, see? How are we doing? No ideas? I struggled to find this one or something like it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, he has a lot of words of wisdom about <laughs> other things, but I thought, I, when I found it, I thought it was funny. Anyway, um, so we'll come back to this quote, right? Because this kind of, this tension of living in a city, the fact that if you ask anybody that lives in a large city, they'll always be unhappy. So they always say, you know, it's too intense, too expensive, I'm too busy. But the fact is, most of these people would not live anywhere else or would only live to, in a similar environment. So what is it that creates these struggles and at the same time creates this beautiful logic of at least often in time tr transcendence that makes it worth it? Um, so, so let's get to the topic of the lecture then t uh, tonight. Uh, it's a strange phrasing. I don't know if you know where it comes from. I'll tell you in a moment. But um, it's a phrasing that comes from a very famous urbanist, particularly in the United States. And it's not somebody who was an academic or uh, who was a planner. It was actually somebody who was a, essentially a community organizer and a writer, and that was reflecting on the problems of cities over time. So um, it's the final chapter of this book. Some of you, if you're very interested in cities, you're here tonight, so maybe you are. Um, it's probably the most famous book that's been written in the 20th century about cities. I think it's not an, an exaggeration. Um, it's by Jane Jacobs, a very... Um, as I said, famous urbanist, arguably the greatest urbanist of the 20th century. And it's about American cities over time. So this book came out in 1961. And it's a lot about New York City. And it's about something that you see today happening a lot in many other cities, particularly in China. So what was happening in her time was essentially this. The cities were growing very fast. This is an age in which cars were becoming more affordable. Uh, and American policy was promoting that. 
but um, there was a sense that the cities that had existed, that were older, that had, you know, that had a certain density, needed new infrastructure, and in particular needed a lot of highways. So there were a lot of highways and uh, movement of so-called, at the time, urban renewal, that were trying to remove density, remove uh, slums, or at least poor parts of cities, they were called slums, and it was trying to create modern infrastructure through cities. And this happened a lot, it's famously in New York and many other American cities, um, particularly through the Bronx. There was a highway that cut the Bronx in two and uh, arguably created the fact that that neighborhood still today is poor. But this was coming through basically lower Manhattan, the part of Manhattan that you know, everyone loved and where Jane lived. And so she thought that she needed to somehow find arguments to counter this as a form of urban planning, right? So if you think again as to what is happening, for example, in many parts of China, this has been a lot of the logics, making your cities uh, grow larger, be more efficient, move stuff, maybe get bigger. And there's a lot that happened in New York that was positive with bridges and so forth. But there was a sense that this was not right. And she was writing a book essentially about how people lived in cities. And you see that these, these two things have a certain relationship to each other, but she's actually discussing how people live in street blocks and how street blocks and their arrangement and the walkability of cities create environments where people can interact with each other and do things in their lives at a human scale. So the scale here is everything. The fact that you're dealing with uh, an environment for people in this picture, but an environment really for the city to function in terms of cars and other things in the other scale. And so what she was emphasizing is that this was the scale at which uh, a lot of attention should be dedicated to and not the other scale. The other scale is serving this scale, but it should not be destroying it. And the book essentially um, struggles. So she does a lot of this that's almost ethnographic, right? It's people observing, as you can in your city here, how Hong Kong works and many of the wonderful things that can happen sort of at the very local scale. Uh, and she's trying to derive ways to understand and promote this kind of uh, neighborhood life. But the last chapter of the book is exactly called the title of the talk tonight, The Kind of Problem a City Is. So the idea is that she's struggling for a bigger logic as to what, how cities work. She's trying to describe what, what is the city? How do we understand it? And so what she says essentially are things like this. She, she describes cities, so I'm gonna use her definition that she struggles to produce and create, but that's very generative in this last chapter. And then we gotta take it and do things with it uh, throughout the talk. So she says that, Real city, cities present situations in which many quantities, several dozen quantities, are all varying simultaneously in, in very subtly interconnected ways. So if I walk around even this part of, uh, um, of Hong Kong, I could do 100 things in about 100 meters, right? It's just amazing. And that's also the nature of what she thought uh, was happening in New York. With more effort, you can do those things uh, over more area in, in other cities. but. To her, it was this, this fact that many functions were interconnected that creates a good city. And so for her, she basically proposed this idea that cities are a problem, as she called it, a kind of thing, in terms of what she called organized complexity. So organized complexity is a way of looking at, uh, at cities that, so that is in contrast, for example, with simplicity, so something like a crystal or, or a simple plan for a city is simplicity. Uh, a gas or something disordered is disorganized complexity, but organized complexity is more like the interrelationships that you find in life in the city. Maybe an ecosystem has some of these characteristics, but in a different way. It's kind of this beautiful interconnection, interdependence, and functional diversity that can occur when these environments are, uh, work well together. And so she has this little uh, elaboration on it that she says cities are almost like organisms, in quotes that are replete with unexamined but obviously intricately interconnected and surely understandable, interesting for somebody who of course is not trying to do science, relationships. So, you know, the relationships that you have actually when you think about it, even when you read her, but when you think just about what these are, are very simple, are very mundane, right? That basically the relationships that we all have to satisfy every day in our lives, right? So this is just one example of a hero that we can think of. I'll use her a little bit later, but you know, you have to live somewhere, you have to be safe, you need to have urban services, you have to have some access to nature, you need to have some transportation, you need a job, uh, you need to have some fun, you need to be healthy. And all these things in a city mean that you're not creating them yourself. You depend on other people to do this for you, and you have to give them something in return. And that's essentially where all this interwoven fabric of a city works. If you can do all these things, 
then you can have a good life and express sort of maybe your talent or inclination and fit in the system. But if you're missing, for example, transportation or a job, uh, you're already, you're already uh, probably not being able to function. And so this whole system around each person needs to work. And that's actually complicated. It's not something that planners think about very well, not from the perspective of the individual. But think again of that boy in Rio and think about how this works. So this is really how the structure happens over space and time within budgets and can change over time is really what organized complexity means. It's not complicated, but it's complicated to make work. Okay? So what I'm about to show you is that this happens, this structure of connectivity between people and organizations that achieve these goals happens because actually we create built environments and we use time through our behavior in ways that sort of bend space and time in interesting ways. And there's, again, no place to see this more obviously than in Hong Kong. Now, this sounds a little cookie and strange, but I'll show you some examples that will make this obvious, and I think you'll be convinced. Okay? So, let me show you a couple of things just in terms of data. This is the University of Chicago talk, so I have to show you some data and some math. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay? So, these are some studies. This is the kind of stuff we do in research. Uh, my colleague Jose Lobo is there, and Danny, a uh, fellow at the Institute, we do a lot of this, and some of these studies we did uh, with Jose many years ago. But what you see here is just many different cities as these points. These are American cities. And what you have basically is the area of roads versus population, so the city size in population. And on, the, on that side, what you see is GDP, so the wealth, the income of a city, how much money it's generating per person in profits and wages, essentially. And so you, see, you find these kind of interesting things. So on this, on this angle, the black line uh, would correspond to the same amount of road surface per person if you went up in population. So what you, find is that, what you find is that there's less and less road surface per person as you get larger and larger cities, right? So what's happening is that the roads are shrinking on a per capita basis. So there's less space, a little less space. And what's happening on that side is that basically the rates at which you're making money is speeding up. It's on the other side of the line. So there's basically this effect where cities are getting compress compressed spatially and in some sense accelerating to in time. So this is a general effect that basically takes um, spaces that are built intentionally and that essentially uh, squeeze people into interactions to create a lot of the things that we create together, including economic activity, but not just economic activity. So in some sense, this is the general logic of the city, and that you see this everywhere. This is for American cities. And these things have numbers that you can go ahead and predict. That's why it gets to be science, right? Um, so what's the picture? Let me just take, paint the picture for you sort of in picture. So you have to do the math, right? Ultimately, that's what makes it science, and it's not easy. But if you do really good science, and if you do really good math, you don't have to do the math. That's the idea. You just create the right picture in mind. A picture is always a geometry. It's kind of a way of looking at space. So that's what I'm going to do. Hopefully that will become clear. It's intuitive in a second. So think about these two spaces that you see here. Right? One space is obvious, which is the physical space. Right? It's the, this is a train station in Mumbai. So it's the trains, there's a platform, then there are all the streets right, in which people are going to go and, and move through the city, the houses, and so forth. And then there are people, and they have their own space of interactions. Right? They're connecting with each other. They're going to a shop, going to school, whatever they're doing. Right? So these two spaces, the spaces by which people interact and the physical space, need to come together. Right? You, you have to go and meet people as you go through these spaces. So it's when these two geometries come together, when these two networks come together, that you find how a city works. So we're going to take our hero. She has lots of friends. They do different things for her. Um, um, so some of them are not friends. They're people she gets services from, doctor, you know, co-workers, et cetera. We're going to take her network, which is all the things that she does with other people, and we're going to put her in space. So this is obviously an American city because it's on a grid, but imagine that each one of these gray blocks are buildings. So I'm not very good at design, as you can see. Otherwise, I would have done something else in life. But uh, the streets basically are the things that are in white and yellow and, uh, and green. And so the idea is that there are also streets. Some are wider and some are smaller. And you see that in every city. So the bigger ones are the ones you, in which you move fast through the city. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> okay. And uh, the other ones are the smaller ones that divide each city block. And so what you have 
is that you can imagine at some level someone's life, imagine your life, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, you wake up in the morning, you go out, you get a cup of coffee from somewhere that's uh, orange, gives you a cup of coffee, you know, green, you go to work perhaps, you spend some time there, you know, then you do something else, and, you know, you go about your life, and then, you know, at the end of the day, you come back home. And so after, you know, this is actually your trajectory through space, but you can start imagining that this is a, what's weaving your social life and all the interactions you have with other people. And this has its own geometry, right? Because it's kind of, this is actually a beautiful name in physics. It's called your world line. So it's kind of your history through space and time, right? And the idea is that the histories of everybody kind of are interwoven in space and time. Right now we're all in the same space and here we are, right? So this is, uh, we're in the same space in a uh, point in space and time's going forward. Uh, but basically this is happening to everybody and you, you can do the math of these spaces. And you know, what is happening is that she's accumulating or um, things that uh, have different qualities in her life. So she may be eating, she's getting money, she may be learning something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of on the one hand mundane, but on the other hand you can actually do the math for it. And this is the way it works, is that all these networks are coming together to produce what a city does. You go to a larger city, the house gets smaller, right? You know this in Hong Kong. Um, but then the roads get a little bit bigger um, and there are a lot more people out. So she doesn't need to go so far and more things happen, right? So in Hong Kong, a lot of things could happen very quickly because there's so much stuff out. And so the same thing would happen, but she, in the same amount of time, she can get more things done uh, and more quantities exchanged. So that's basically the logic by which space is squeezing you and accelerating what becomes possible. And even though this is not true for everybody, on the average creates an effect. Okay, does that make any sense? So this is more or less what happens, and we can see this a lot in data and all kinds of things. I'll show you some. So what this means basically is that we're all a little bit on a treadmill in which we, you know, we go out, we make some money, make a living, but then we need to spend it on all these things that we require to make a living. And you can actually compute all the costs of moving around in these spaces, which are the things there, and there's some math to be done, but basically you can do it under certain assumptions. And there's a bunch of social benefits that have to do with all the interactions you can have. And you can conclude, basically, that the city exists in these two, in this regime in which you get some benefits of these interactions, but if the city gets too congested or too dangerous, these interactions are negative, then the city collapses. And if the city becomes too diffuse, like some American cities, then it's not worth it to go around. So the city splinters into smaller places. So you can kind of have a logic of how cities work and how dense they should be given their benefits and their uh, costs of moving around. So if the costs of moving around are high, like if you have to walk, they're relatively high, then everything's more compact. If somehow you can move around in a car that's relatively fast relative to your wage, then you can move larger distances and the city kind of falls, not, doesn't fall apart, but gets less dense. Okay, so you can kind of, it's kind of, so there's this pulsating activity that's happening in the city and this allows you to predict all kinds of things about the built environment, its density, the power dissipation that you use, and things even including like land values. Why is it that land and rents are so expensive? So I'll give you some examples. These are the wages of American cities again. So once you take these effects into consideration, you see that they all fall on the same line. And this means that in American cities that are larger, like New York or Chicago, LA, people make more money per capita, but they also spend more money. So they're on a faster treadmill, so to speak. This is true of GDP of many, many different nations, including China, for which the data is very noisy, as you can see there in, uh, in gray. And it's true of other quantities like uh, patents, innovation, and even crime, even though you don't have a lot here or in parts of Asia in the United States. Unfortunately, we do, and that's also a kind of interaction that tends to be higher in larger cities. So I thought I'd show you a little bit this kind of in this region. This is China, so it's very messy, as you can see. But on the average, these lines have the same slopes I've been showing you. And in China, what's been happening is that this is just GDP, so the wealth of cities. It's just been going up very fast. And, um, and so, again, if I take that, those points that are yellow and put them all on the same line, they all behave the same way, which is nice. You see Shenzhen, your neighbor here, is the richest place per capita in, in China, so you can see it in this. But here's something sort of interesting. That was, when I was preparing this, I was just uh, looking at Hong Kong and Singapore just for good measure. I'll show you Singapore a little bit is that Hong Kong is still, of course, much richer than almost any city in, um, in, uh, in, in China. But if you ask in time, how is it changing? 
it's actually converging to cities in, in China. You may like this, you may not like it. I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's true of Singapore too. But this is not because Hong Kong is getting poorer, is that Chinese cities are getting richer faster than you are at the moment. So that's kind of interesting. And then one of the things that's interesting is that the dynamics, what changes in cities, not to you personally, but sort of on this average, tends to be quite similar. So, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore are some of the greatest miracles of change of the last generation. What happened in your city or in Singapore and, and in a few other places in Asia is just extraordinary. So here's, for example, GDP per capita. So sort of, uh, again, a proxy for wealth. This is, includes inflation, uh, but basically you are today about um, six times richer than your parents were. So there's a factor of six, which is amazing. I don't think that will ever happen again. But it, it was just an extraordinary uh, jump in which now you're one of the richest places in the world, as is Singapore. But that happened essentially in one generation since the 1960s. But if you look at, you can think, wow, Hong Kong, yes. Okay, and you should be proud. But if you look at Singapore, they did exactly the same. So you see that this is one to one. I, it's kind of a horse race, in which I put the two cities. And you see that Hong Kong, if you're below that line, Hong Kong's doing a little bit better in some periods. And in the last few years, I'm afraid Singapore is doing a little bit better than you. You probably know that. But it's very similar, the trajectory. And just for good measure, I had a couple more quantities. So I like data. So I'm going to show you some. This is, um, so this is, uh, this is just GDP. So forget about this. This is an actually uh, carbon emissions. So you can be proud of this one. Hong Kong is one of the most efficient cities in terms of using energy. A lot of your, uh, a lot of your manufacturing is also moved out of the city but you, you consume very little energy in transportation. So Singapore uses a lot, more, um, a lot more energy, but in the last few years, they're actually being a lot more aggressive at cutting emissions than you have. Um, and this one's my favorite quantity. We're doing a lot of work with this quantity, also in American cities. And, um, and uh, basically, uh, this is life expectancy. So uh, what happens in cities is also, uh, with urbanization, is not just about wealth. It's actually a lot about all kinds of other things. It's access to services. And one of the indicators that's most fascinating is life expectancy. And as you can see here, Hong Kong has a higher life expectancy than Singapore, in this case, for comparison, and one of the highest in the world. Um, but if I adjust for the initial period, if I put this point back in the same point, then you see that basically the improvements that you've experienced since 1961, when this data starts, is very similar again to Singapore. So even though what is happening in these places is obviously different and individual experiences are different, there's a whole convergence of the processes that are happening in urban transformations that you can see when you start looking at data and comparing places. And that's one of the lessons from a lot of what we're doing now in urban science. Okay, so let me tell you about bending space and time a little bit more because I find it an interesting way of looking at it. I'm a physicist by training, so I always like to bend space and time, that's what we do. But, uh, but there are ways in which cities do it that it's interesting. So one of the things that happens, I showed you this very quickly, but the implication of some of the math I showed you is that the infrastructure actually grows faster than the area of the city, just the land area. And what that means is that the infrastructure starts taking over. So in all large cities, the infrastructure needs to go into the third dimension. So pipes get very big, for example. This is just a big pipe, I think under Moscow in this case. But the pipes for Tokyo, for example, go three times around the Earth. There's a lot of pipes. Um, I don't know for Hong Kong. It's kind of Hong Kong special because it's so three-dimensional. But, but so the infrastructure needs to be dealt with. and needs to occupy its own space. So here are highways. You see this all over Hong Kong, all the bridges and viaducts, both for cars and people, that kind of cannot exist on the ground, right? There's no space. So they have to start existing overground uh, or underground in other cities. This is Rio. This is, of course, just also poor management. But this is, again, the network taking over. And it's in a way that the space of connectivity, as you see, is mismatched to the space of, uh, of just existing on that surface. And so um, this is kind of wanting to connect that space better. And of course, they'll have to deal with that at some point. But, uh, but they, what happens in a lot of cities is that in the center of cities, all these cables get buried, usually, because they cannot be on the surface anymore. And a, a fascinating quantity, this is one of the last pieces of data, there's one or two more, is this idea that you can look actually at what happens with land rent. So why is housing always expensive in large cities? And the reason is that it compounds these two effects we've been talking about. One is that there's less space per person, at least on the surface. And the other one is that there's more money per person. 
So if there's more money and less surface, there's a compounding effect that money per unit surface, so you know, dollars per square feet or per square meter, actually go up faster than incomes do. So unless you do something about this, housing prices grow very fast as cities develop. And uh, the, what happens is that they grow almost twice as fast as incomes. This is data for single family homes in, in the United States. But that number 33 is double the number that you see for, um, for incomes. And so the solution, you know it in Hong Kong, is that you need to create more space per unit of land. And the way you do that is by going high. Right? So all cities that get large have to do some of this. You can do it like LA, where it's high, like two or three floors but forever. Or you can do it, Hong Kong is much more limited in terms of land, where you invented this wonderful three-dimensionality that's, I don't know what it's like to live there, but it's wonderful to visit and see you know, how amazing it is that it could ever work, right? <laughs> but there it is. You have a city built like this, and you've been able to accommodate a lot of people on the same unit of land surface. And I know it's still expensive, but imagine how much it would cost if everyone had to live on the ground, right? So the city needs to expand. So it's like space is buckling and needing to create more space um, such that it can accommodate all these people. So space is being bent. And in some ways, I'll show you also times being bent. This is just cell phone data. We use a lot of sort of big data to see how people are communicating with each other. This is actually for a small country, Portugal, where I grew up. But it shows you that the networks of communication are also getting denser in the same way. And this is one of our favorite quantities that the data is not very good, but it's always amusing to discuss which is uh, walking speed. That people in larger cities tend to work a little faster. So almost everything that you do tends to be a little faster in a small town, which is very annoying, right, when you go to small places unless you go on vacation. But, uh, but for a little while, you can, so this has been done for a bunch of European and American cities. And so it shows you that uh, people speed up a bit. And when I gave this talk in New York, I don't know if this has worked for you, but I always show sort of this picture. So every year there's a piece of news like this. And there's a comment, basically, by somebody that gets interviewed that says something like this. That, you know, people come, you know, usually for Christmas shopping if it's New York. And, you know, these people don't know what they're doing because they've not been sped up sufficiently to exist in that space. And so they're just a nuisance. They're just stopping everybody from moving. So the city, you see, is not just in space and in time. It's in yourself. It's in your behavior. And you, you're using the fact that you need to do more things per unit time by speeding yourself up in certain ways and making up time, right? By going faster, you have a little bit more time in the places where you're actually interacting and doing things. So all this kind of comes together in a cute and sort of interdependent way that connects behavior, space, time, costs, all together in the same logic. And the final one, the part that's more interesting that was a bit implicit in that picture of the individual with other services, is that this is actually the story that we're beginning to understand is the story of creation of wealth. The creation of wealth actually seems to be a story. Uh, this year's Nobel Prize, was, uh, one of them was Paul Romer, who's one of the men who uh, pioneered the idea of what is at the root of uh, economic growth. He's actually a UChicago alum. But, uh, but the idea is that in poor societies, you tend to have that people have to do everything themselves. They're in a logic of subsistence, maybe they're farmers. And they have, you know, to grow food, to get water, to get rid of trash, to, you know, build their houses to some extent or with some of their friends. And so even though people know, have a lot of knowledge, the knowledge that they have is quite similar to other, other people in that society. And this doesn't go very far. They're just allowing them to survive. When you move to a city, what happens is that a lot of people are already doing a lot of things. And so most of you here, I'm sure, end up doing strange things in life if, from the perspective of the farmer, right? You may get a brain surgeon or an artist or a scientist or a really good chef, right? And this stuff happens because people need to find a way to get services from other people. And you do that by creating knowledge and activities and services that other people want. And that process creates knowledge. And that knowledge can create new value. So cities promote this kind of the creation of these ecologies of functions that then translate into knowledge and growth at the national level. So this is still a picture that's developing, because you can imagine that we don't know all that everybody knows at uh, a disaggregated level. But it becomes a very interesting picture to try to see. We can see this through professions or type business types, how in large cities you always get kind of new professions that seem to show up. And that's not even the whole story, because you know if you say chef, then if you are in a city like Hong Kong or New York City or Chicago, there's really weird kinds of food and kinds of things that keep popping up. 
And so that process, which is so weird and so full of diversity and wonder, is actually the process by which we also create wealth. So it's kind of interesting to put that together. It's a very urban process. So this is a measure of basically people doing super creative things by the measure of this uh, uh, economist, Richard Florida. This is a paper that Jose and I write, wrote uh, almost at the beginning of our work together. And I'm sure most of you here would qualify as super creative professionals, like people in media, science, engineering, management, even sports. And so what you find is that these people are uh, more and more represented as sets of professions in larger and larger cities. So large and large cities, of course, don't have a lot of farmers, don't have a lot of even um, people dedicated to uh, basic services, but they tend to have a lot of people dedicated to innovation and to management of information. Okay, so then I just want to take you a little bit before, uh, uh, a little bit more quickly. How are we doing with time? Let me just check. So, good. So this is all kind of very general, right? We've been talking about bending space and time and people and, and connections. But what does this tell us about how to manage cities and, 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 uh, and to have a sense of what is good and bad urban planning? Going a little bit back to Jane Jacobs, right? So I just want to give you some examples. And I think when I come to Hong Kong, I kind of look for these in, you know, in how Hong Kong solves these problems. So this is where I have a bunch of pictures also of Hong Kong. So, you know, a long time ago, almost a century ago now, there was the idea that to accommodate, to make cities healthy and accommodate movement, you needed to create, this is Le Corbusier, is very famous in urban planning. It was seen at the time as a great radical idea that would solve all the problems of cities. But basically the idea was to create these very high towers and a lot of spaces for cars. And, you know, cities would then have maybe, um, you know, more, more clean air compared to what they were before. That was a wrong calculation but then uh, somehow would work better in terms of congestion and so forth. But this creates horrible, horrible cities for people, right? Because there's no space to socialize or do all the things that Jane Jacobs was talking about. So this is kind of the wrong idea, even though it has some of the right ingredients. This, of course, is Hong Kong, and it's kind of interesting, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's Central Street, I think. It's sort of where you put connectivity, right? So instead of putting highways through the middle of the city, you put things that, you know, there's a lot of staircases. Hong Kong has this three-dimensionality that's so interesting. But you put basically the, the, the walkways and, the, and the, the electric staircases that allow you to go uphill. They're kind of very interesting, kind of mu much more microscopic kind of innovations that are interesting. This is the famous one that a lot of people in urban planning have been interested in. This is Medellin, Colombia, and it was a city that was very poor. It's a city that a lot of the poor neighborhoods existed up the hills. You see a little bit this here. Uh, there were slums and there were, uh, at some point, quite dangerous places. And what uh, the mayor, uh, at some point, uh, who was a reformer, thought of doing was to connect the city in some ways. That would connect rich and poor people, allow people to, um, to use different parts of the city for different, in different ways. So what they did is not only did they create uh, transportation infrastructure with cable cars, they could do this in Colombia because even though they have many problems, they do have uh, reliable electricity, so you wouldn't get stuck up there. But one of the things that was genius was to put the most beautiful building in the city in the slum so that people came to see the view and go to the library. That's what that black building is. But at the same time, then, you know, there was a whole set of businesses and little bars and things that started developing. And this started making rich people come to the poor neighborhoods and poor people being able to go to work in a way that, you know, they didn't have to walk down the hill and so forth. And it was actually quite revolutionary in a way that created sim relatively simple solutions uh, they were not so expensive as other things would be, but that had this logic of connectivity uh, of different kinds of people and opening up possibilities. And in Hong Kong, of course, you have all these niches that are always so interesting to see. I won't dwell on this, it's your city. But there are all kinds of weird stuff happening in every corner. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of technology that is starting to make cities work differently, right? It's very hard to navigate a city without a cell phone anymore. I think we're all now used to it. But all the share economy, all the stuff that's creating uh, business models that are actually a lot based on information, as well as money, but information to a large extent, happens always in these dense environments. And it requires instruments and pieces of information that allow us to read these environments. For example, I got completely lost trying to get into this building because there were like 50 things that I could have done uh, in that street corner over there. And it was only, um, you know, uh, Google was actually not very bad. It was not bad. I knew it was in the right place, but eventually I found it. But it would be very hard to read these spaces quickly, as quickly as we do, uh, without these informational aids. So sort of information and, and the way we structure spaces are really coming together 
in ways that keep changing. So let me just tell you a little bit about the things that we're facing and that we're doing in research as, as going ahead and then I'll finish. So a lot of the things, so, so far I told you about existing cities, the way we study them, the data that we get. But one of the things that are interesting if you have uh, a theory, a perspective of how cities work, is that you can start thinking about the future and how things may play out. So one of the things, so let me give you four things that will happen. You know, here's one thing that kind of should blow your mind a little bit. This is kind of hard to read, but I'll read it for you. These are projections for the largest, uh, 15 largest cities in the world. Uh, and the first column is 2025, 2050, 2075, and 2100. And uh, one thing that's interesting for this region is that the cities of China won't grow, are projected not to grow a lot more. So Shanghai and Beijing, so Shanghai is here somewhere. There it is, it's about 20 million, maybe this is an underestimate, but it'll grow a little bit more. It's really the cities of India and Africa that will grow a lot. And they will grow to um, have 30, 50, 60, 70 million people. We've never created cities this large at all. And they will have to have very high density. So a lot of the things that people are considering is basically how do you create good cities at high density? And there's no better example than Hong Kong. So they will come knocking, and uh, they'll start asking, you know, how is it that you do it? How is it that you could create an, a new city? Maybe leapfrogging some of the things you've done, but nevertheless has some of the uh, ways in which Hong Kong works well. So this is kind of crazy because the biggest city in the world we have today is Tokyo. It's about 40 million people. It has this exceptional transit infrastructure. It's very safe. And that's not what we have with, uh, you know, Jakarta, Mumbai, or Delhi at the moment. So there's a huge transformation that needs to happen. This is another one, right? All these cities are actually quite informal. China's different. Uh, but, but India, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa certainly are basically growing very organically. And, um, and so there's a big challenge, even as we see the built environment develop, uh, to understand how you could actually work with vernacular architecture, things like this, but at the same time create the connectivity and living conditions that are good, right? Again, Hong Kong has, a, I think, many examples just from observation. But what we're doing in this space is that the built environment of cities is being completely mapped. Over the last few years, next few years, you will see that from satellite data and from people on the ground with phones and other things, we'll know everything there is to know about the built environment. Every building, every shack, every parking spot. You see that a lot in open street maps. If you haven't looked, you should go look there. It's an amazing thing. It's the Wikipedia for maps. And if you, if you go to Google Maps or something like this, the satellite information now is at 38 centimeters. So we see everything. So what do you do with that data? What are we going to do with knowledge of the built environment and its transformations that would allow it to develop in a way that's more organic but nevertheless delivers results? So we're using a lot of this algorithms that allow us to analyze what are deficits of infrastructure, for how these spaces work together with people that are on the ground in neighborhoods and try to develop planning tools that are more collaborative tools for gradually developing the built environment. This is another problem that is true uh, of many American cities, but uh, as I told you, we were talking to uh, Chinese colleagues uh, in the last uh, few days at the Hong Kong Center. And even as many cities, first I showed you the picture that many cities will be growing, that many cities will start to shrink. And this is because many countries are entering demographic transitions. You know that you have very low birth rates here, but a lot of people like to come to Hong Kong so you can manage that. But China won't be able to do that, right? China is going to be hit by a huge, a very fast demographic transition. Uh, already the cities of uh, sort of north uh, east China are going through some, uh, um, there's rust belt cities of a kind. And if you imagine China going through a process where a lot of those cities, most of Chinese cities become rust belt cities, that's not going to be pretty. So the question is, you know, how do you shrink the infrastructure? This is Detroit, famously, of course, but it had very large infrastructure, had a lot more population. And once people leave, this become impossible to maintain because you don't have the tax base and the revenue to maintain the infrastructure, not, however beautiful it may be. So this is kind of a tragic situation, but that you need to uh, basically think of infrastructure and things that we build in a much more dynamical way that can come up and down as is needed. And this is kind of... I like this picture because uh, as I speak, look at their faces. They're not, I think they're not convinced by what he's announcing at all. Um, <laughs> but this is the mayor of Los Angeles in the United States. So Los Angeles has been a very progressive city in trying to, uh, to uh, become one of the cities that's leading uh, total decarbonization. Uh, so they have a new goal as of a couple months ago to be carbon neutral by 2050. 
In LA, if you imagine their problem is completely different from Hong Kong, is that they have a lot of cars. And we just don't know how to decarbonize uh, the transportation sector that's based on cars very quickly. But anyway, what's happening is that a lot of cities have these very ambitious goals. And it's a time in which, obviously, it's critical that we find sustainable solutions. Uh, but there has to be a lot of research and technological innovation, but also good planning of the sort we've been discussing that allows these cities to be better as they go through these transformations. So um, this is kind of a challenge that will happen for us in, in our lifetimes, probably. And that's a bit make it or break it, of course, in China. That's make it or break it. But this is really happening everywhere. Hong Kong, again, uh, has been sort of the model child for this, not so much because it was intentional. It was part of your struggle, so to speak. But this is a very famous plot. It's been done many times. But it relates the energy of, uh, used in transportation, actually gasoline in this case, or petroleum. It's in British English versus uh, population density. And you see that Hong Kong is the city that's really at the far end there. So it uses the least energy. And it has, of course, the highest density. So this has been an argument in planning, unlike American cities or even other cities, to create cities that look a little bit more like Hong Kong because you're so thrifty in terms of the energy that you use because of this. So you're sort of the, I know you didn't do it intentionally, uh, but there it is. So a lot of people want to know how is it that a city could be rich as you are, but still uh, use such little energy. Okay, so that's more or less what I had to say. I just had, uh, I thought there would have be a bunch of alumni uh, here, and I think there are some. But I just want to tell you a little bit what we're doing at the University of Chicago in terms of education programs, in case any viewer is interested. This is our institute. It's called the Mansfield Institute for Urban Innovation. It's dedicated to fundamentally studying cities not so much as bunches of problems, but in terms of the fundamental processes that allow them to work, and then from that perspective, uh, address some of their challenges. Um, so this is sort of the commandment that goes with the institute. I just made this up, but bear with me. <laughs> but when I talk to planners and policymakers, they always just tell me, oh, it's polluted, it's expensive, you know, people are sick, uh, whatever. They said, no, that don't start there. Start with thinking, why is it that you live in Chicago or Hong Kong, right? Do you live in Chicago because it's dangerous? Do you live in Hong Kong because it's expensive? No, you live in Hong Kong because of other reasons, and it's also expensive, right? So you have to start there and then try to think about how to fix the things that you have. Um, so we have a bunch of sort of initiatives. We're always looking for good ideas. That's part of what we were doing here with Chinese colleagues. Uh, some of them have to do with architecture and design. We have a strong program in housing, uh, a lot of things in data. There's something that actually we, we're working with WeWork that has to do with the design of spaces that uh, consider uh, psychology and mood and how people interact with built environments. This is easier to measure and we have very good psychologists that do this both in terms of design of green spaces as well as internal spaces. But companies, I'm afraid, are leading the way in actually doing that as they design this sort of space. So it's sometimes interesting. Yes, you're being observed. But, uh, but it, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, how this can be used for good and not as a surveillance tool. But it's sort of interesting that, again, the behavioral and cognitive aspects uh, of people and the built environment can be more connected. And then, uh, as I said, sort of uh, ideas to develop the uh, neighborhood level uh, kind of services and built environment that exists in more organic ways. And this is sort of a collaboration with UN Habitat and other large nonprofits that are collecting this data in each neighborhood, have communities, but need to have bottom up planning tools. So these are all informed by science, but also in partnership with a lot of people that are doing practical work. We have a new sort of undergraduate uh, degree that uh, we're proud of. We're just standing this up that has a component of urban science, so a bit more quantitative. But in general, it's about cities and the environment. Uh, Carl Sagan was uh, one of our famous alums, so we work in that spirit. Uh, we have a doctoral program and uh, a young researchers program. Um, Danny Zun, who's over there, is one of our fellows. And so we look for, we try to create essentially an environment where people that are interested in this theme that don't fit into traditional departments uh, can have a, a, an education and, um, and research career. So uh, this is a very famous text for the uh, Conoscenti that basically started a lot of what we think is urban scholarship and urban science is 1925. This was developed at the time because Chicago and American cities at this time were boom towns, like Chinese towns are today almost. And so people were just fascinated by the transformations they were seeing, of people coming to these cities, living in different ways, trying to fit. It was a very dirty but very dynamical environment. We are re, uh, re reissuing this book, and we're having a panel on April 4th, if you're in Chicago. But I just want to reflect a little bit on this. The fact that we actually, 
have made uh, the great leap that's happened in the last few years uh, has been that we don't just look at Chicago in terms of what's happening there, but uh, we come to places like Hong Kong or China or even cities in India or Africa, and we see what's common and what's different in these environments, and that we now have sort of an analytical lens to understand generally what the human condition is in these spaces and how it can be changed and improved to, uh, for the better with imagination, but also with sort of rigorous thinking that allows us to see what's common about our struggles and our glories and how these spaces can be um, made better in terms of the human experience, but also our uh, relationship with the earth and the environment. So cities do things that are sort of magical. This is Shanghai. It's a famous photo of what happened in 25 years. This kind of speed of transformation, uh, we only know how to make it in urban systems. But the question is, how this, can this go on in a way that's the best way, that really speaks to the positive human experience, uh, a little bit in the, in the spirit of, uh, of Bruce Lee, and also a more positive relationship with the environment and, and the earth. So that's all I needed to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have the slides there. Yes. Um, you, do you have time for questions? I do, yeah. Before, right? So we actually have buffered quite some time for you guys to throw in questions, um, discussion. That's actually a very Chicago approach with the data, half data, plus mm -hmm. very engaged discussion. Oh, so should I sit back there? Yes. Okay. okay. You can do it without microphone. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, for your talk. Um, I, I, you come from a city which has uh, uh, not a problem, but some, some severe challenges mm -hmm. in the form of uh, uh, ability to meet the promises in the form of uh, pension to municipal workers. Mm -hmm. And your city is in probably one of the worst states that <laughs> compounds that problem. Mm -hmm. The state of Illinois may mm -hmm. be even in worse condition than the city of Chicago. So as an urban uh, thinker, how, how do you wrestle with the fact that municipal services, which are a foundation for successful cities mm -hmm. like uh, Hong Kong, uh, you know, may just not be available in your thinking. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard. I, I don't have a magic bullet for that. But um, it, one of the issues, you know, there are issues that are obviously in the context of Chicago and Illinois politics and, you know, the history of management or lack of thereof of the situation. But I think at the same time, um, there's just the issue that um, when you look a little bit at the history of, uh, of funding these services, it's much easier to do so in the logic of growth and development, where there's improvement in, for example, real estate prices and things that generate revenue, than in the logic where that growth really slows down. And then sort of your m margin maneuver <laughs> is much smaller, and then any um, you know, any mismanagement costs you a lot and projects into the future. That's what we are a lot with Chicago. Chicago is just about not growing at the moment. Uh, and of course, has a lot of legacy problems. So the next mayor, we're about to have a next mayor, will have to do something about that. And it's going to be difficult because uh, Chicago needs to be attractive and still change a lot of its uh, economic base. So it's a, a real bind. Uh, the, the answer is to create some sectors that uh, attract and, and generate value and economic activity. And um, we, we are trying to work with different civic agents in the city, including some people in government, to try to think about what that is. But no magic bullet, right? It's always a, a very, um, it's a balancing act. Sometimes, uh, of course, it's very easy for you to compare some uh, data uh, if they are quantitative data. Okay, but uh, sometimes uh, be, uh, behind those uh, quantitative data, maybe um, there are uh, some uh, very uh, subjective will that uh, Always. make a uh, comparison between different systems. Um, uh, you, you get a very different answer. Let me take an example uh, um, uh, around uh, a year ago uh, when I was in a business trip to Japan. In one city, that is uh, Yamaguchi, uh, that uh, I'm staying in a, a hotel that I think my room is uh, bigger than this room. Just a room, 
And then uh, in, in the same trip that uh, when we are in uh, Tokyo, actually the, my room is uh, <laughs> smaller small. than the toilet of the room that I just <laughs> mentioned in uh, Yamaguchi. Okay, if you if you uh, measure that uh, in a very quantitative uh, uh, method, that uh, of course the living condition in, in Yamaguchi is much much better than uh, in Tokyo. But for this um, okay, in in Tokyo you can go elsewhere after the business dinner. Okay, um, on the other hand, when you are in uh, Yamaguchi, you, you can go uh, nowhere else after <laughs> the business dinner. What I mean is, uh, okay, that staying in that room if in quantitative data, definitely that is much, much better than Tokyo. But the point is, if that is only for one night, that is definitely okay. But sure. on the other day, if you are, have to stay for life, definitely I think a lot of people would choose uh, Tokyo. What I mean, and my question is, um, when you are doing all this kind of analysis, okay, um, how can you um, go into the uh, analysis of those uh, data or the, the subjective view of some persons that are uh, actually you cannot easily uh, measure? Sure, I mean, there the are two things in what you said. On the one hand, I think I actually was talking to a similar effect. If you're in Tokyo, a bit like in Hong Kong, space is at the premium, right? And so maybe your, your experience can be your own, but in general, you will have less space. And that's what you were experiencing. Uh, and that's consistent with everything I was describing. Uh, on the other hand, in Tokyo, you can go outside and there's a lot to do. That's exactly what we were describing. In a smaller city, it's the opposite. So what's interesting about this is just, that, just as a general logic, and I'll get to the subjective in a second, is that with larger cities, certainly cities in the same country where they're comparable, you tend to have this trade-off um, of, uh, to simplify things a little bit, of space. You have to have more space in small cities, but there's less social space, less thing, fewer things to do. To a space that's more intense socially, there are more things to do, but there's less physical space. My argument was that these things actually are very much related. Okay, so if you buy that, that that's just an average statement. Each, it's possible that different people then have a different experience, and. Uh, so forth. Now, there are many things that are subjective, and all this kind of information that we have now does not tell us that um, your life is very constrained, right? I mean, essentially, if you can balance your bank account and not break the law, uh, and you know, afford the energy to move around and your rent, you can do whatever you want. So the things that we can measure about that I showed you are very simple, very basic things. They just have to have to do with incomes and costs, so balancing your bank account or for a firm, whatever that is. And you know your uses of space and the energy and space that you use to move around, uh, but everything else that's special to you, to your experience, you can manage in different ways. It's just that on the average, just like insurance companies know, people are fairly predictable in the things they need to do, but they do them in different ways. They're personal, so those things are compatible. And then there are some things. This is not this is not my own work, but this work of colleagues where actually you can measure a lot of what people might call the subjective experience. Uh, so we're doing this, I mentioned briefly, with the design of spaces, either built spaces like this, or how people experience, for example, parks and green spaces in the city. Um, and so um, you, you, can just, uh, you can just have cognitive uh, scientists design ways of, for people to express how they feel, if they're calm, if they're stressed, in some cases, you can measure that with um, eye movements or other ways. And you can, you know, it's not that it captures the whole being, but it, it starts to show you how behavior, the physical environment, and an individual human experience are somewhat connected. So there are ways to get to that. I don't want to say that you can measure everything and predict people. You do not. But there are ways to uh, demystify a little bit the fact that some things are purely subjective. Um, at the same time, all that we're talking about here does not constrain your life in any very specific way. It just allows you to understand generally what people do. So, um, question. Sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, looking at a clean, sustainable city, do you ever look into using uh, 
natural infrastructure. <laughs> Um, can you say more about what you mean exactly by natural infrastructure? By, use, by working with nature, for mm -hmm. example, yes. uh, coastal lines, uh, for example, uh, using water, uh, like Spun City in, in St. Jen, those are concepts right. using nature. No, absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm a professor of ecology and evolution, so a lot of people are interested in increasingly in understanding ecologies, so natural ecologies that also exist within the city and to some extent are designed, to some extent are natural. But so vegetation, for example, this is an obvious example, but it's just worth saying. Vegetation, particularly trees, they can uh, help you with water management, they help you clean air, they also, in cities that are hot in the summer, uh, they stop radiation to come to impervious surfaces and then warming up the city. So people are designing increasingly ways in which nature can perform functions that are good for people, but also uh, does well as an ecosystem in the city. So this is in the city. And then there are questions about how the city relates to uh, ecosystems also outside the city. So for example, New York City gets its water from a protected area that maintains the water clean. So, uh, so this increasingly is being uh, both understood and used much more intentionally. Uh, I think that there's probably some room still for politicians and people in positions of controlling what gets planned and built to use more of that and to understand it better. Um, and different cities then have different um, trade-offs as to what is most critical for them uh, and what is more achievable. But increasingly, this is a big way in which we design cities, particularly in, in ways in places that are public and that can include um, vegetation as well as some aspects of how uh, patches of nature in the city are interconnected so that they have corridors for biodiversity and maintain uh, a certain level of, um, of, uh, of real ecosystem dynamics and evolution that's not artificial and purely designed by people. I'm afraid to say Singapore does pretty well at this. They're a bit engineering towards that, but they capture the concepts and they're trying to experiment with them. Um, also, you know, technically in terms of data, we, we know a lot, again, because satellite data is so good now, we can tell a lot about uh, both, you know, people are gardeners in the city, but then you can tell a lot about each tree has been mapped now in most cities. We can observe it and see how green it is, so we see how stressed it is and how well it's doing. So there are many ways of bringing together both sort of these ideas with active management of cities and create better environments with nature as an active component. But uh, still a lot to do in practice, yeah. There's a question, there's a lot of questions, but I'll go with you here. Oh, thank you. I, yeah. I definitely yeah. want to uh, carry on from that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Singaporean. And, um, oh, good, OK. Tell us about it. <laughs> right. um, thank you, Professor. Um, so continuing from that question, I, I would like to have your insights in terms of um, building regulations. Because we talk about urban heat a lot in Singapore, right. because we're so dense, right? Um, so what the urban um, planning development uh, uh, regulators try to do is they, they angle the city in consideration of you know the monsoon season right. and how uh, wind goes through um, the country so that it, you know it lessens the impact of urban heat. Now, um, I think I, I would like your insight into <coughs> regulation. How how far or how quickly do you see um, <coughs> regulation in Hong Kong, for example, or in the UK keeping up with urban heat and climate change? Um, because in the UK, they now have a task force looking into build, building codes because they, they suddenly realized that the building codes in the UK are actually starting to um, not be able to cope. It's mm -hmm. getting warmer and warmer in, in London. Mm -hmm. So the ACs can't keep up. You know, people have fans and they have all this insulin, but they don't, have, they don't have buildings to keep them cool. So what are your insights into building codes and regulations to tackle climate mm -hmm. change? So I think, I think those are still evolving and they're very local. So I'm not sure that there's a general answer to that. I think what's, what people are understanding now, even in Singapore, as you know, it's very, it can get very hot because of where it is and because it has now, it's a high density built environment, but it's hotter than here. So it just captures a lot of heat and stays hot. Um, a lot of that heat is not only captured by radiation, which Singapore does a lot of vegetation now, but it's also produced by humans, right? In terms of the air conditioning's working and the cars and all the, all the building mechanics and so forth. 
So I think that uh, people are trying, uh, the work that I know, uh, people are trying to, there's a project called Cooling Singapore, they're trying to model what it is and they're trying to, they're finding that a lot of, not just the design of the built environment and building codes, but all the functioning of climate control and, and mechanics in the city can be better managed in some cases. But in Singapore it's hard because it's just where you are, it's hot. In other places, um, I think that I think architects now have the tools at the building level to do better work. I think in terms, for example, airflow through a city and so forth, that's a much more general problem that it's probably easier to do, frankly, in cities like in China or India where a lot is being built than in a city like uh, in the UK where a lot of it is already built and you can only affect it a little bit. Um, a lot of innovation that's coming in, in the building industry is coming through standards of, of uh, equipment, energy efficiencies, designs. And that's quite active, but sometimes the industry reacts, uh, building industry reacts against very strict standards. But that's, that's a moving target and it's interesting. Um, in the United States, this is being driven by of, associations of architects that are trying to up the standards. Because for them, as architects, that also values the profession and the knowledge that they may bring to more the building industry. So there's a bit of a war of knowledge <laughs> and of political will in terms of implementing more ambitious targets. But I think the landscape is right and increasingly cities are doing this more and more. I think still it's true that Singapore and uh, particularly South Asia, probably and Southeast Asia, those are critical regions or south, uh, the southwest of the United States and so forth. Those are regions where that's much more important than Northern Europe, where sometimes they even prefer to be a little warmer, but, but it's changing. So. So, so many questions. Um, why don't you have there and there? Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, so, uh, so, for instance, in Hong Kong, um, a big issue is the wealth inequality, right? And um, I'm just curious, like, in your research, uh, do you guys factor into any account of um, uh, an area's exclusivity uh, um, and its, uh, for instance, these uh, different wealth and incomes of the people there. For instance, um, someone in, um, for instance, downtown central, they may be there as a street cleaner, and they will not be able to access all these amenities that are spearheaded by local companies, right, that, um, that have, like, one of us could access. So, uh, yeah, do you have any advice about building a more inclusive mm -hmm. uh, area, and does your research yeah, so I didn't talk about that because it's a more complicated picture and it doesn't always translate across nations as well. And I frankly don't know anything about it in Hong Kong. Um, in China, we're asking our Chinese colleagues what there was, and of course it's very sensitive in China. So, that, um, But in, in American cities, and particularly in the context of Chicago, some of these early studies, that's what they were doing. There was a, a very deep understanding that the city is different in different parts of the city. So these are called sometimes neighborhood effects in sociology. And it is this idea that you can have in the same city a rich neighborhood with all the good services and everything, good school typically, et cetera. And then you can have poor neighborhoods that um, don't have good public services and often also don't have a lot of um, retail and commerce and so forth, so even a supermarket. So this is very typical of American cities, and it's very, it can be very tragic because it creates these ghettos that are very hard for people growing up there in particular to transcend that disadvantage. Having said that, we've had maps like that in the United States and in Chicago for 100 years. So uh, as I was telling somebody last week, if the data is speaking, right, some people say let the data speak. If the data is speaking, no one's here, no one's listening. Um, so I, I think that there are different ways to look at that. One way is that the city remains open and that the public sector and government has a role that if, it, if it's strong enough, it can actually create good public services in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And particularly schools and social services are very important and safety. Uh, less of an issue in Asia, but important issue in, in American cities. Um, then there are other issues that have to do with gentrification and the fact that if you have a good school, people move in and out. And, what we see in North America, where some of the, a lot of these studies have been done, is this, uh, this effect not only of gentrification, but also of, um, it's called neighborhood polarization, where you end up with neighborhoods that are just rich and neighborhoods that are just poor. And in American cities, the government tends to be weak, and they cannot move resources, they should move resources from rich neighborhoods to poor neighborhoods, because that will create value, actually, if nothing else. But uh, cities often cannot do this easily. So it's a question if Hong Kong can or cannot do 
that sort of uh, equalizing distribution, distributional effect that could also keep the city more dynamical and people mixing. I don't know the political situation, how well he can and cannot do it. But Hong Kong has the advantage that at least it's quite dense. So you can, in principle, experience parts of the city. And at least around here, you see both wealth and poverty very close by and p young people, old people. But I'm sure that in other parts of Hong Kong, it's not quite like that. It's a complicated problem. All cities are putting that in the agenda. All American cities and European cities have equity as one of their main issues. But it's harder to deal with. And the best way is through being aggressive with good public services. Uh, you mentioned uh, Detroit. And you had a question there, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, the picture of Detroit is uh, very inspiring. Now, we are all in the age of wealth and growth, but uh, cities are organic, I suppose. So there should be a life cycle, right? So there should be growth and decline and death. Right, now we have built so many new cities. So sooner or later, some of them may be declining like Detroit, and they, mm -hmm. they may even be, be dead. So how should we look into this problem? Um, well, no, it's not, it's not true that they have a life cycle and that cities age and die. This is not true necessarily. You know, cities that we've had, they're still there, right? Rome's still there. It decayed, came back. Um, so a city is open-ended in principle because it's being renewed by always new people coming in and leaving new economic sectors potentially coming. Uh, now, whether it remains vital and keeps growing, or at least maintains its vitality, depends a little bit on all kinds of factors. I think the main challenges going ahead, one is aging. A lot of parts of the world will experience very strong and fast aging in ways that we have not had to deal with. Um, you know, Developed Asia is, is facing this almost the, fa the fastest aging that is happening throughout the world. Japan is, of course, the, the leading example. But Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. The Singapore, Hong Kong, you have a lot of immigration in your small places. So you can manage that through immigration, as the US does. But for other places, it's very hard. And China is sort of the mother of that problem. You know, It's going to be very hard once China enters. It's already entering, but really enters the, the echo of the one-child policy. It'll be potentially disastrous. So that's one thing. So when you run out of people, <laughs> Or uh, an industry moves. So what happened in the United States and Western Europe is that a lot of manufacturing left the cities, uh, now about 50, 60 years ago. And when entire sectors leave the city, then there's a lot of employment that's gone. And with manufacturing in particular, it's very hard if you have that job to get a different job. And so that's the story of Detroit. And it's happening in some Chinese cities, but it's a question whether uh, those sectors can continue in the city and find a way forward or not. So that's a different effect. It just has to do with industries or sectors moving to different parts of the world or being substituted by robotics or whatever. So those are different problems. But the aging one is inescapable. And that's really, um, you know, you can create good cities for, for aging populations, but once you run out of, of people, then the city will shrink. So uh, there's that. The city does not necessarily, the other thing that's interesting is that when you look at places that are sort of at the front of that, uh, Japan being one, Eastern Europe actually is another. What you find is that the large cities, a city like Tokyo, is still growing. But all the little rural places and smaller cities are the ones that are aging very quickly. So that's sort of a, an effect that also depends on the size of cities and some of their uh, attraction, particularly to young people. So it's kind of a complicated effect, but it's very interesting and we'll have to deal with it. That's why I put it up. So you had a question there. There are also a couple out there, but maybe I'll try to answer a little bit more quickly so that we can go through a few more. Uh, Professor, thanks very much for a very <coughs> interesting uh, presentation. Um, I would like to ask you what kind of uh, outcome do you expect from your series of research? <laughs> I'm raising this question because you mentioned a lot of problems, particular problems faced by city. How do you abstract this problem into general theories? or maybe in terms of urban density. Uh, bear in mind what you mentioned about the subjective element. Mm -hmm. Is there an ideal urban density? Uh, or are you looking at a low level of getting a package of so-called fast practices mm -hmm. in terms of solving various urban problems? Yeah, I would say it could be a long answer, but I think that the, the, the answer is that the way we're describing cities in terms of theory and the kind of picture I described today 
is not so much like a, an ideal density or an ideal form of the built environment, but as a process, as the way people are living in a city and how density and you know, connectivity, transportation mediates that process. So in that sense, that process can happen at different densities, certainly residential densities. So in Hong Kong, at least in this part of the city, it's all very dense. But in an American city, you can live at low densities and then commute to work, so you can work at higher densities and then move out again. So a city can exist in many different forms, and so density is known not to be um, particularly determinant of, for example, the wealth or innovation of a city. But the fact that people are connected and can do things together is critical. So you have to describe what that process is and then how it's mediated by residential density, transportation, accessibility, and so forth. And from that perspective, you can say that a city can exist at high density if, for example, it deals well with pollution, deals well with conflict, deals well with uh, you know, um, trash and you know, uh, unintended outputs of that activity. Heat. So, uh, so that's the thing. What Hong Kong is doing is that it has to work at a high level of precision almost and a high level of performance because it needs to keep a very intensely used environment that packs a lot of density of people, density of users, density of energy even, uh, clean, functioning, safe, and that's special. It's very hard to do. You do it very well without thinking probably anymore, but it's, it's, it's really special. So there are a couple questions there in the back, I think. Um, I was looking at the two of you there, and then there was one there. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, you mentioned dynamic buildings. I was hoping for an example there, <laughs> uh, like adaptive to demographic change. Do you have like maybe an example on, on that? I mean, there are many examples. I'm not sure that's what you're looking for. It's not like a robot that's configuring itself necessarily. But you know, Jane Jacobs actually had a, a, a nice saying that said that new ideas need old buildings. And she was thinking a lot about industrial buildings that could be repurposed, for example, like this probably, for then workspaces for other uses. So, uh, so that's obvious, right? But nevertheless, having that possibility that you continue to use the space. There's sort, of a, there's sort of an engineering of this in certain environments, like hospitals are buildings that are designed to be very configurable. So all the walls go and can change and so forth. So there's some people that look into that. They're not necessarily good places to live, but, but they're functional for other uses. Um, but you know, you see the emergence of a lot of this co-working spaces, micro-manufacturing. I think, again, Hong Kong, I remember when I was a student a long time ago, I came here and I stayed in a youth hostel, one of these high rises. And I was just blown away because you know, it was a hotel and then there was somebody that was a tailor in the apartment next door and there were businesses and residences, all this stuff happening. You could imagine coming back five years later and it'd be quite different. So it's possible to do that. Um, I think depending on the use, but particularly as a lot of heavy manufacturing and large scale activity becomes less central to cities, then these micro uses can use the built environment in ways that are creative. But you need to have a way to permit that. So a lot of cities exclude that because they have strong zoning that doesn't allow you, for example, to have micro manufacturing together with residents in the same building. But increasingly that makes sense that you could have that and you could permit that and allow it to happen. So it's happening all around us, but it, there's a way in which um, it's being, in some places being encouraged and then can use old characterful buildings to do new things. So maybe next question. Um, hi, I was uh, just thinking that um, a lot of the data you show us shows how Hong Kong performs really well in a lot of these objective <laughs> measures. Um, you know, uh, energy efficiency, life expectancy, but um, actually we perform quite poorly on measures of life satisfaction compared mm -hmm. to cities of similar, or countries of similar wealth, mm -hmm. and actually like, comparable to much poorer societies in terms mm -hmm. of life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any research on the relationship between life satisfaction and population or wealth or population density in cities. Uh -huh. um, I don't know sort of a killer systematic result that would answer that, but I think in general, the relationship is that people in large cities, dense cities, are always unhappy. But they still don't leave. <laughs> um, so I don't know what to do with that. Uh, but you know, people are happy in places like New Zealand and so forth, right, where cities are very livable. But you know, it's not like everyone wants to go there and live. I mean, it's nice, but you know. So, um, 
So I think there's something to be said about the intensity and struggle, to go back to Bruce Lee, of these environments. Uh, they, are, they don't make you happy in this contemplative kind of way, but I think there's some satisfaction and strife that is positive. We have some data actually now for U, uh, US cities. We're just playing with this, so I'm not, we don't have a paper out. But it has to do with mental conditions. It's quite extreme. So, but things like depression. Uh, and it turns out that people are more depressed in the countryside than in larger cities. In large cities, they're stressed. <laughs> so you put people in scanner, they're kind of like, they just light up. But they're not depressed. They're less depressed. So, you know, pick your poison. Um, um, one thing that's true that it, it probably is important to say, in Hong Kong, you don't have this, but in larger nations, what happens is that people usually come through larger cities in the life cycle. So young people tend to come to larger cities as they form their professional life, as they come to school but sometimes, but particularly early in their professional life. And then often, once they maybe have kids or want a, a, a different life later on, they may move out of such a large city or at least move to a calmer part of the city. So in many countries, there's sort of a life cycle that people use the intensity of large cities at a time in their lives where they're seeking that and where it's useful to them. And then later in life, they may, experience, they may prefer a different environment. In Hong Kong, you maybe don't have so much choice, but um, it feels a lot more like New York or something here. But yeah, Sorry. Um, so maybe I'll, I'm sorry, but because you had two questions around you, I'm going to go over there first, and then if we can. It's not your fault, but uh, it's just kind of, you know. And then there was a question there in the back, too. Um, hello. So I come from India, uh -huh. and the city in India called Bangalore. Yes. So um, I've seen the city grow so rapidly myself. And when I first came to Hong Kong two years ago, the, the Bangalore that I left and the Bangalore that I recently went back to wasn't the, wasn't the same because I think it was much hotter, and I think um, the traffic and all of that is much more. So I think cities in certain countries are growing at such a a uh, rapid pace, as you mentioned, that I think they started losing their uh, key characteristics. For example, people used to talk about how the weather in Bangalore used to be really good, but now they don't. <laughs> so I'm just giving that as an example. So um, because of this rapid urbanization, yeah, people basically talk about how they're losing their key characteristics. So what do you, what do you say about that? And also in terms of climate change, because of, uh, because of unplanned growth, Right. I mean, so India is probably the, if China is uh, big and fascinating, it's already much further down the transformation. So India still is, you know, the numbers vary and people discuss them, but about a third urbanized. So you have a long way to go. And as you've seen, the projection, because of also your population growth, is, is going to have much longer demographic transition. Your cities are going to grow a lot more for a lot longer. So you still have half a century to go. <laughs> it's scary. Um, we work a lot. We, we're trying to work in India, too. We, we're trying to work with the Smart Cities mission. They're trying to inspire local governments to think about new ways to leapfrog what they can do with municipal services and so forth. It's hard in India because local governments are not powerful at all. Uh, and so um, at the same time, then speaking to character, it's a, it's a curious thing, you know? I think it's true that you can always think cities are such dynamical environments that, of course, when they're growing particularly, that you, of course you'll experience a lot of change and people will feel that change that, that it's not what it used to be. At the same time, they tend to amplify what was there. So, you know, I don't know. I think New York and I've been coming to Hong Kong alone for at least 20 years or to New York or Chicago. And I think people identify that that's still, it's a different city, but still has somewhat of the same character. There's some food that's still there. There's some way in which people, so I don't know, you know, it's sort of a transformation within a certain character. And we, even as it changes, it stays the same. So I'm not sure exactly, but that transformation is what you expect uh, cities to produce. And in many ways, it's good, right? In other ways, it's not so good. With climate change, I think that's a major issue. Indian cities, as you, uh, for the reasons we already touched on, um, there's very weak capacity to plan and to introduce, um, um, you know, whether it is knowledge about heating or uh, transit or land planning that would generate some pattern of growth with some density. A lot of Indian cities are growing a lot at the boundary, 
with a lot of traffic. So it's just kind of the, the least planned growth that you can have almost that then ends up creating a lot of cars and traffic and sprawling uses. So at the moment, um, that's what's going to happen until, uh, until somehow uh, better transportation infrastructure and land management happens. So as you know, the large Indian cities are now building metros, and so that's coming a little bit, probably too little, too late, but still it's happening. And increasingly what's happening too is that you can map these cities. So you can have very few Indian cities even have a property cadaster that's digitized. So Ahmedabad or, um, or Pune, there are a handful of them that actually know what property exists, who owns it, and how it can be transacted. So those things, you have a lot of capacity in India to do well, but it needs to be institutionalized a little bit more with government. There has to be innovation. And I think I'm optimistic about India. I think you have the capacity, but it's not been implemented yet. You don't have a system. But India is both scary and wonderful, what will happen there, right? Because it's also not a country that, where its cities will probably grow because of industrialization, like China did. You have to find your own model. But you have also a lot of poverty and strife that needs to be also ameliorated and, and changed and needs to be sustainable. So I'm fascinated by India, and we're trying to work a lot there, but um, it's a big challenge. Um, there was a question there in the back, I think, and then we'll come back to you here. Uh, hi, Louis. This is Edmund. Oh, Holland yes. Medicine. Good to see you. Hi. And, you know, the, um, any advice on how we could inject creativity, you know, to affect more citizen-centric good design, you know, when regulation and administrative mindset seems to be pretty overwhelming sometimes? Um, I don't know about your context here in particular, but I think what's happening is we're playing a little bit with this idea. I just touched on it that because we can know everything about the built environment and we have very detailed maps of almost everything, right, including all the shops and services and even maps are kind of being transformed at the moment because they're now a digital object. What we're playing with is the fact that if you look 10 years ago, GIS and mapping used to be something that you needed to have an advanced sort of technical education to be able to do. People talking to GIS and all that. We don't do any of that, right? We just have a, a phone and it works well and we can map ourselves. So everyone's a geographer in that sense. I think there's a possibility that takes that process a step further, uh, or a big step further, which is that everyone could almost become a planner in the following sense. That you now have a map of the built environment such as it is, and we can all imagine playing with that, editing it, such that it becomes a plan for what it could be. Now the problem that that creates is that there needs to be an agreement as to what the built environment could be. But now you can aggregate a lot of people's ideas and preferences around uh, a map that therefore is rigorous in terms of what, what happens in space and uh, imposes certain constraints that are not just people complaining, but actually could be a creative process. The places where we find there's openness to this are the most informal, like even African cities where the government has very little capacity. In more developed cities, this is much harder that the government actually would allow people to come up with designs and would be able to discuss them. But the technology is there to create sort of, I call it really a political process in the best sense that politics means cities, right? The science of cities even. Uh, but to use this knowledge that can be managed together to create potential futures for what cities would look like. So I think in the future everyone could be a planner. Um, so there are two questions here, and I, you had a question there, I don't want to forget you, but um, you, you're right there, so why don't you give it to him, and then there are two there. My question was on design as well, because I don't know, science in the ways about what is, and you just add me right. the question of how we make a particular design. And then um, the question is, uh, do we need a different model, which is to say, as you just mentioned, um, we may decide where to go. The question is how to get there. <laughs> and so we need a lot more about them in sort of like uh, back testing. Right? Like, like what are the steps if we, as you mentioned, it, all those people can decide and agree to get there, how do we get there as a different map? Well, the, the how is always sort of a more practical question, right? But I think, you know, I'm an academic, right? So I, I work with ideas. I don't have to, I depend on other people to do the, the how. <laughs> But I, I, I do think there's a grain of truth, at least, if you allow me to think that unless you create the idea that the how could be different and there are new paths that people could potentially use and follow and create, 
uh, it's not going to happen because the past of the profession in terms of professional planning, you know, in practice, uh, it's full of quite old ideas and legacy ideas and technologies and you know, for building, for example, that are not being transformed very quickly. So I think the role that I think for us at the University of Chicago and other researchers, there's, by the way, very nice work at uh, Hong Kong University, at uh, the Chinese University. Many people are thinking about uh, ideas about technologies and cities in, in your context here, too. Um, and I think you know some of them. So um, that space uh, needs to demonstrate there may be new ideas that are more dynamical, more uh, embedded with knowledge for how we conceive cities. And then that needs to translate into a how, like, as we said, uh, tools for planning that are more flexible and collaborative than they have been in the past. So that the bottom up, right, the great, um, I think one of the holy grail of design, of urban design, has really been that you incorporate uh, uh, knowledge of people, knowledge from the bottom up into the design process. And you know, we've had participatory planning and certain practices that try to do that, but almost as consulting the public most of the time. So uh, there's an opportunity with technologies that we have now that have to do with information to create better environments for that collaboration to happen and capture that knowledge and create flexibility in the design process. But that's still not operating. It needs to be invented and experimented with and so forth. Um, so, but it's, it is happening particularly in these very informal environments that are being built now because that's just necessary. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic to a large extent, but it does rely on a mindset that needs to change. And I think that the role of people that do research and education is to help that mindset shift and opening up possibilities that then are explored in practice. So there are two questions there, I think, at least. Um, yeah, you can start there in the back, and there's one here in front of you. Thank you, Professor. And then you had um, one. Too. Uh, this question is kind of sensitive. Um, it's about, you know, Hong Kong is very densely populated, so the living condition is not that good. And so the government always do some work like reclamation and uh, to exploit the country parks, which both of which attract a lot of critics and complaints from local people, uh, from the NGOs. And because I study ecology and biodiversity, so I'm also one of them. And um, uh, however, um, most of my friends or say some some people on the internet, they say that the ultimate reason for like. The, the living uh, the living condition things is because a lot of mainlanders they come to Hong Kong so make it like more densely populated and I'm also one of the one of the mainlanders coming uh, like coming from mainland China so um uh, so I'm not biased towards Hong Kong or towards uh, China but um do you think that that's an unsolvable problem? <laughs> I mean, I'm in the business of thinking that no unsolvable problems, but you need to think about them, right, and find an answer. I don't know. I mean, there's the problem of uh, population size and, and how it's accommodated. Uh, you know, Hong Kong is a, is, is a rich and vital city because people want, have wanted to come here for a long time. And I think that that's part of what, you know, to the question about when, what happens when cities shrink, including their tax base, it's bad. So you need, growth can be good if it's well managed. I think we have better knowledge about how to create built environments and operate them. They're much more uh, in tune with the environment. I think you have a beautiful environment around here. You know, the Hong Kong Center has actually done a great job integrating its built environment. I know it's not the densities you're describing, it's a different part of the island. But, but it's beautiful to be there and to be part of the coast and part of the forest. So, I think it does require asking the question that you're asking. How is it that you could have high densities, accommodate people, create good living conditions, and have the best environment? And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but you have to understand the, inter the interrelations, the connections and impacts that people can create on the environment and vice versa. So, um, so it's, it's a problem of knowledge and then designing with a knowledge that's synergistic between these two things rather than in opposition, which is the lazy way to do it but it's often the way we do it. So there's a question in front there, because you, you've been trying to ask for, in you too, I'm sorry, so both of them there. <laughs> Hi, you talked about well, science, really, um, but what urban problems would you like science to most solve, but you uh, would be the biggest challenge or most exciting challenge for you to apply your methods on? <laughs> so, I mean, depends. You can pick different places where those are exacerbated. 
I, I think th they came up maybe a little bit in the talk, but certainly in the questions. I think that um, if you think about cities as these places where uh, you, you can enter and then create a socioeconomic life that's fulfilling, uh, I think that's really uh, uh, hampered and, and really reduced in cities that are, they have very strong inequality and there are different reasons why they can have that and they have barriers to that entry and that also, um, which can be economic and be racial and also are violent. So those are issues of every city that some cities deal in ways that are better than others. So Hong Kong has a relatively good story to, do, to tell with integrating people at high densities and creating a safe environment. I think I'm sure there are, there's room for improvement like inequality. But, but those things are n almost natural that they will occur as issues, but they need to always be managed actively such that these environments remain open and good for people. I think, you know, the big looming problem of the next decades is that we don't destroy the environment and therefore destroy ourselves too. So cities are leading the way as places of innovation that are reducing uh, at least some of their uh, environmental impacts, but there's a lot that we need to do both locally and beyond. Um, if you can do that and accommodate the people, for example, that are coming to Indian cities, in, in some decent way that improves their living standards, then I think we're doing well and it's a process. It's not something that will ever be perfect. Perfect. We talked about cities being complex and open. That means that they're never perfect. They're always striving for something. But I think all these um, downsides of this process of being connected, being interdependent, and needing to use resources and energy need to be managed in a way that are, posit that are positive. There are, there are, there's some bright spots in the history of cities. One, for example, is health, right? There was a time where people died in cities. There was horrible environments to be. But, you know, we discovered how to cure cholera, contagious diseases. Most of these issues are no longer issues of cities. At some point, they were. So, you know, there are questions how to address these other issues more systematically, such that they're not um, so badly recurring issues, and therefore improve the human condition as well as our relationship with the environment. It has to be done in the next generation, because that's when everyone moves to cities and the world becomes like that. Otherwise, the world would be horrible in many ways. So you had a question there. Thank you, Professor. I have a question. I'm from, I'm from Beijing, and uh, I've, um, I've noticed that a um, lot of um, well-educated young people now live in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, and, and work in the second-class cities in mainland China. So um, because of a lot of problems of the big cities. So my question is, I was wondering whether there is um, this problem of these big cities could uh, offer the opportunity for the second class cities to thrive and even make them to surpass these big cities and to reshuffle the distribution of big cities in China and Thank you. Y yes, exactly. I mean, that's the way uh, it usually happens. Um, there are times in which it happens more and times in which it happens less, but. Um, uh, I don't know as, as much as you know about China. China is complicated, but you're seeing these processes in action. I think there's not a lot of data for me to comment on that. That's what we're asking our colleagues in part. But for example, in the United States, you find that a lot of the cities that are famous for innovation or wealth, let's say New York, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Boston maybe, these cities are not attracting a lot of population. In fact, if you look at uh, particularly American-born population, people are leaving because these cities are very expensive. And, and congested and so forth. So it's the cities, for example, of Texas or of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where Jose lives and places in the West and Midwest, they're attracting more population. So these are second uh, tier cities. They're still, in some cases, large cities. You can have more space to the question we had before. You can have a bigger house, et cetera. But, um, and you can have you know, a good professional life as well. It's maybe not as extreme as some of the other cities for some of the sectors that are um, they are leading the way uh, worldwide in those places, but still, so what's happening is that population is effectively moving to second tier cities, and those are the ones growing the fastest. So that is likely to happen, particularly uh, as I understand them with the controls, also the government's putting in Beijing and Shanghai for population growth. It will, it's gonna be very hard for those cities to keep accommodating more people, and therefore, uh, the question for the secondary cities is that they're attractive places, not just places that people have to go to, but that they want to go to. And that I don't know, you, you can judge better. You had a question for a long time, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if, in, in your view, there are any of these cities that are projected to grow very strongly over the next 20, 30 years that, in, in your uh, perspective, are actually getting things right in terms of laying the groundwork for development more generally? No, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> what's the brightest example we can think of? Um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, the, the cities that are growing very fast always experience a lot of issues at, uh, at the frontier. I, I cannot think of, uh, I don't, I feel on the one hand, I don't know enough about what each city is doing uh, in a place like China or India to answer that easily. There are spots that are brighter than others. So for example, in, in the west part of India, Pune, uh, Medabad are cities that are using a little bit more technology and improving their government practices and you know, creating universal uh, sanitation, et cetera. They're, all that is positive. But a lot of the cities that grow fast, they just expand in, in space. Uh, you know, sounds like you're probably also from the United States. So we see uh, the cities of uh, Texas, for example, those are the, like Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, those are growing very fast. They're attractive places, but they're sprawling a lot. And so they have a lot of problems with traffic and so forth. So those are not necessarily bright spots in terms of city planning. Um, I don't know, you know, it's sort of a struggle. I don't have sort of a, the brightest example I can think of, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry. Um, okay, last question. Uh, uh, for the imagination, uh -huh. uh, there is a film uh, called Downsizing. Human size are much, much, much more shrink very much from, 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 from your original size to the very, very small size. Yeah. So, how do you see this alternative? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood the question. I'm sorry. What is shrinking? Downsizing. Downsizing. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Well, I don't think anyone really wants that, given a choice. <laughs> um, well, so I don't know. I, I think. I think it's a struggle to live with very little space, and I'm sure you're familiar with that in Hong Kong. Uh, there are ways to making that a better experience, but it, it's always actually uh, an issue. So I don't know, you know, it's managing that density will be an issue for many places, but um, um, you know, but you're an existence proof that that can be done to some extent and create a good city. So I'll leave it there. So thank you very much. Let's thank you. Big you. you should take it. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm.